So thanks so much for the intro. I'm really, really thrilled to be here talking to you about clutch diagnoses in right upper quadrant pain. And what I would say is that we love, love, love to blame that gallbladder for all right upper quadrant pain. And you know what? We're not wrong. It's the cause of a ton of right upper quadrant pain. So we've got to give it some respect. But on the other hand, it can't be our scapegoat for everything. So today, I want to take you through four cases that I've personally seen in the emergency department, cases where I was 100% certain that the diagnosis was going to be something related to the gallbladder causing right upper quadrant pain, and I was so wrong. So I want to show you that by scanning the gallbladder and making sure it looks okay, and then by diverting your attention to nearby structures, you can make a lot of clutch diagnoses that can really kind of help direct care for your patients. Our first case is that Friday afternoon, pretty much any emergency department. And this 56 year old gentleman comes on in, host of medical problems. And he's really just complaining of bloating of his abdomen and some right upper quadrant pain. So on exam, he does have a little bit of wheezing, a little cough and some edema, but he convinces me, this is all baseline for him, nothing new, don't worry about it doc. So I move on and I'm like, yeah, all right, well, let's look at your gallbladder. It's probably the issue here. So I look in that right upper quadrant and, and this is what I see. I see, I'm looking at this gallbladder and I'm like, all right, come on, there's gotta be a stone in this little neck here and this long axis view. And I cruise on over to the short axis view looking for stones. And you know what? I've got nothing. This is a pristine gallbladder. Nothing that would explain his right upper quadrant pain. So the gallbladder can be tricky. So what I do is I kind of scan on over a little bit more laterally just to make sure I'm getting great views of the gallbladder. And I find this familiar view, which is our right upper quadrant fast view. And I'm happy with it because I know this view well. And I take a quick look at this kidney, just making sure there's no black center that would indicate like hydronephrosis, maybe a stone is the cause of his pain. And that all looks great. And I take a quick look over here. So here's our diaphragm right here, this bright white structure. And just above it is a triangle of black. Well, black on ultrasound is fluid. So this gentleman has a little bit of pleural fluid. So at this point now, I'm moving away from that diagnosis of gallbladder pathology and I'm trying to figure out what else might be going on with him. Let's first take a look at what it would look like if he didn't have pleural fluid. What does normal look like? So here on the left, you can see the liver. The diaphragm is outlined in blue. And then right above it, what you basically see is what we call the mirror artifact. We see a reflection of liver above the diaphragm. It's an artifact. There's no liver above the diaphragm, but it tells us that there's no pleural fluid there. In contrast, in our patient, the diaphragm is still outlined in blue on the right, but we see all that black above it, and that represents fluid. So we know that there's a bunch of pleural fluid there. And then there's another thing that's really important to point out here, and that's the spine. The spine continues above the diaphragm. That is never normal, okay? And when you see that, you wanna think that in this case, for example, all of that pleural fluid has like shoved, shoved the lung out of the way, and the fluid is conducting the sound waves really nicely down to the spine, which bounces those sound waves back to the probe giving us an image of the spine. So never, ever normal. All right, so that's great. We figured out that this guy has pleural fluid, but what do we do with that? Well, when I see pleural fluid, whether it's incidental or something that I'm looking for in the ED, I think about volume overload states and I think about failure, heart failure, kidney failure, liver failure. So in this guy, I'm like, huh, a little bit of cough, a little bit of wheezing, a little bit of edema. He doesn't carry a diagnosis of CHF, but you never know. So I take a look at his heart. And here's a parasternal long view of the heart. And this is just done with the probe on the left side of the chest indicator up towards the right shoulder. Let me tell you, anytime you can put a giant help me bubble in the middle of the left ventricle, you're in trouble. This left ventricle is totally dilated. The walls barely move towards each other. It's a mess. And you can also tell that this anterior leaflet of the mitral valve doesn't come anywhere close to this interventricular septum. So that's another sign of heart failure. In a in normal left ventricular EF, this would actually hit that interventricular septum or come really, really close. So I'm leaving behind gallbladder pathology 
and I'm moving towards a diagnosis, a new diagnosis of CHF. Now, one more pearl that I have for you is that CHF is one thing, but decompensated CHF, really acutely decompensated is another. So how do I figure out if someone's drowning in their own fluid? It's a pretty easy test. You put the probe on the chest and you look for something called beelines. And these are the vertical bright white lines that you're seeing there on the left of screen. They come down from the pleural line. And if you're seeing those in multiple areas of the chest bilaterally, so if they're diffuse, that is an awesome test for saying, yes, I am looking at acute decompensated heart failure. If you don't see them, you pretty much need to be looking for another explanation for the patient's symptoms. So let's bring it back. Why does he have right upper quadrant pain? Well, when the left ventricle isn't pumping well, you better believe that you're gonna get a congested inferior vena cava, which is what we're seeing here. This is the inferior vena cava containing all that blood. It's plethoric, it's really dilated, and it doesn't really vary with respiration. That's abnormal. And it speaks to the idea that there's also hepatic congestion, okay? And that hurts. That makes your right upper quadrant hurt. So perhaps people remember Obi-Wan Kenobi talking about millions of voices suddenly crying out in terror and being silenced, but I, I think we're mishearing that. I think he said hepatocytes, and I, I do think he was specifically talking about what happens in acute decompensated heart failure. So those hepatocytes are congested, the liver capsule stretches, and then that right upper quadrant starts to hurt as it did in this gentleman. I have seen this countless times as the presenting symptom in new heart failure. My second patient is late on a Monday afternoon and I'm screening out in triage, so I am not supposed to have an ultrasound with me, but this 52 year old gentleman comes in, really only a history of hypertension, and he is like doubled over in pain. His right upper quadrant is killing him. And I am like, slam dunk, you are in acute cholecystitis. Let me just get the ball rolling and scan your gallbladder. So I take a look and his gallbladder is once again pristine, but I like to take a look at adjacent structures. So I scan a little bit superiorly and I get this nice view of the diaphragm here, bright white and a sliver of fluid up above it. Okay, so this to me is basically another pleural effusion, but a small one. And in this situation, it actually piques my interest. And I'm starting to say, okay, the pathology is not in the belly for this gentleman, even though I thought for sure it was, it's in the chest. And this makes me specifically worry about a pulmonary infarct in the setting of PE. There are other possibilities, but with this amount of pain and the location, I'm now worried about this. I switched to my high frequency linear probe. And in this situation, I can actually see the pleural line really well. And what I see is that there's like a triangular divot cut out from it, okay? On the unaffected side, the left side where he's not having pain, the pleural line is nice and smooth, no divots. So once again, I'm identifying another abnormal finding. This wedge-shaped kind of area that's black and irregular is probably a peripheral pulmonary infarct. All right, so what do I do with this info? How good is this for actually saying that he has a PE? Well, it's reasonable. It's making me think that because in this study where nearly half the patients had a PE, if you scanned and found either pleural lesions or infarcts like we're seeing on the right, two of them, or you saw a pleural infarct and a small unilateral effusion, your specificity for PE was very good, 95%. So what it does for me when I see these things is it bumps PE way up on my differential if the clinical situation fits. Now, if I'm thinking PE, I always scan the heart. And here's a sub view of the heart that demonstrates a very concerning finding. That RV is bigger than the LV. So now my clinical suspicion for PE is even higher. And also I'm worried about this guy because when the RV gets this dilated, I'm thinking big PE. And we can see that that left ventricle, it's really not filling at all. And this is what leads to hemodynamic compromise and collapse in these PE patients. So I've gone from slam dunk acute coli to now PE, big PE, maybe ICU for this guy. I'll add in that inferior vena cava one more time. And it's gonna be plethoric. If you have an obstruction to forward flow in the lungs in that pulmonary vasculature, the IVC gets congested. And now this guy has two reasons to have right upper quadrant pain that local pulmonary infarct 
and also the fact that his hepatocytes are like crying out. Now, there's one more thing that I've seen, which is highly unusual, but I wanted to point it out because it was kind of a neat finding. And that's this, here's the inferior vena cava. Normally it would be black filled with fluid or blood heading into the heart. But in this case, it's echogenic because this person actually has an IVC thrombus. If you were to ever pick this up, just scanning that IVC, you definitely want to think this person is clotting and they could have a PE. The next patient that I saw that I think really piqued my interest in the sort of right upper quadrant pain as something other than the gallbladder was on a Tuesday night shift. The waiting room was totally full and this was a young guy. And I was like, how did he make it back? But the nurses were on it. They noticed his heart rate of 128 and he got a bed. Sitting in the ED, he looked great. Oh, really, there was nothing on exam that looked remarkable and he's 24. So he's like coming in because something's really bothering him but he doesn't want to talk about it that much. We do get to the idea that maybe he's passed out and he can't really tell if it's from pain or why. So I go to look at his gallbladder and I can't find it because shooting through the liver, which we see on the top of the screen, all I see is a giant puddle of black around the heart. So a massive pericardial effusion. I was standing with one of the residents, our jaws hit the ground. We were just like, no way, no way this guy has a pericardial effusion but he did. Bad case of pericarditis, causing a massive pericardial effusion, and that's why he passed out. So when I see pericardial fluid, I always want to know, is there tamponade? And the hallmark of tamponade is RV diastolic collapse. Well, that's what we see here. This is a very obvious view of this right ventricle just scalloping inward and collapsing under all of this fluid. This is a parasternal long view of the heart. So not everything is this obvious though. Okay, here's one where I know that if this patient, patient isn't clinically in tamponade, they may be soon. But what happens when it's not this obvious? Let's face it, when people come in with pericardial effusions and are potentially in tamponade, they're tacky. So they're actually really hard to tell when you're looking at their heart if they're in diastole or systole and when that RV is coming inward. So one thing I like to do is cognitively separate things. When you're scanning, you're getting images. And if there's something that you really have to dig deep into to understand, I'll take the machine out of the room and you can review your clip right on the machine and you freeze it at the point of interest. So you can really do an analysis. And this helps me kind of separate getting the scan and analyzing it. So here I've frozen this image basically with the mitral valve open. Okay. That means that blood is flowing from the left atrium to the left ventricle. We're in diastole. And all I have to do is look at that right ventricle. I see it scalloping inward and I know, hey, actually I think we are seeing some mild kind of diastolic RV collapse. If not clinically in tamponade, I'm worried about it and mobilizing fluids for this person getting ready potentially for a pericardiocentesis. And it's gonna be important to look at that IVC. This is part of the diagnostic criteria actually for tamponade. So here I can see big plethoric IVC headed into that heart. I see all the pericardial fluid right there. And I can tell you that the reason this guy wasn't complaining of anything in his chest is because he had really bad hepatic congestion, right? This was new to him and it was really stretching that capsule. He had a lot of right upper quadrant pain. So at this point, one more person in whom a surprise diagnosis comes up when their chief complaint was right upper quadrant pain. My last patient, so on a Wednesday evening, low acuity area, 29 year old gentleman. And he says he's just feeling really fatigued and it hurts when he breathes. So he's basically pointing to his right upper quadrant and his right flank saying that's where it hurts. Now for me, it's always important to scan the gallbladder to kind of take that off the differential. So I go to do that, but I'm also interested in his vital signs because his O2 sat's 93%. So I'm already thinking maybe it's not something in his belly Maybe it's in his chest. Scan the gallbladder, beautiful. I move a little bit superiorly in that right upper quadrant and get a great view of the liver with the lung just to the left of it or superior to it. So at first glance, you might be thinking, hey, this is a mere artifact, this is normal. But there's two things that tell you that's not the case. The first thing are all these bright white dots in the lung. 
So these little guys are static air bronchograms. They're trapped air. And this is what you can see in either a pneumonia or atelectasis. So it's abnormal. The other thing you can see, which we've talked about before, is the spine sign right here. So in this case, it's not pleural fluid. It's a bunch of pus and fluid in the alveoli that's conducting sound waves to the spine, allowing us to see it. So always abnormal. So this is hepatization of the lung. And this is an abnormal finding that we most often see in pneumonia. One more finding you might see are dynamic air bronchograms. So here are these bright white dots are actually not static, right? They're now moving up and down. And dynamic air bronchograms are very specific for pneumonia. Scanning for pneumonia is not that easy. Since it's a patchy and potentially focal process, you've got to scan both the anterior and the posterior lung zones. But if you see hepatization, if you see air bronchograms, if in this case you see focal B lines, all of those are signs of pneumonia. And for sure, adding in like a lumpy, bumpy, really irregular pleural line, that's another sign of pneumonia. Chest x-ray, we know it's a bad test for pneumonia, okay? So if you get good with ultrasound, comparatively, it's gonna be more sensitive. And I hope I've convinced you guys that the right upper quadrant gallbladder cannot be your scapegoat for all pain there. You've got to think about things like PE and pneumonia that cause local infarction and inflammation that makes people feel that they're having bad right upper quadrant pain. And you've got to think about those hepatocytes in CHF and tamponade. If you've got hepatic congestion and capsular stretch, that's going to create right upper quadrant pain too. Thanks.